Why am I sharing this particular story with you? I am blown away by the story of what's going on in Ukraine. And there isn't a day that goes by without somewhere in the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, someone writing about the fear of Vladimir Putin using one type or another of nuclear weapon. I am really frightened by that possibility of the leader of Russia being backed into a corner and feeling desperate as more and more arms are being sent to Europe. That being a disastrous possibility, I thought that it would be appropriate to share with you the story of the discovery of the atomic age. How did this begin? How did people know about this? What, what is the story behind what should be humanity's greatest fear right now, and that is nuclear weapons? The story is worth knowing, worth telling, worth appreciating. The story starts with Lisa Meitner. She was a young Jewish girl in Vienna, born on November 7th, 1878, the third of eight children in an intelligent, educated Jewish family. Her father was an attorney. He was a free thinker. But as many in Vienna at that time found it more expedient to uh, perhaps not be Jewish. And so like many others, including Gustav Mahler and on and on, they gave up quote, being Jewish and presented themselves as Protestant, Catholic, etc. <clears throat> Lisa grew up in her young days and on to college in what's known as Fin de Siècle Vienna. It included the artists whom you recognize, famous artists and famous physicians, Flansteiner of blood fame, Semmelweis, Sigmund Freud. It was a heady time. <coughs> And the writers, Stefan Spy, Arthur Schnitzler, Theodor Herzl, the founder of uh, Zionism, etc. This is a very, very intellectually heady time. Many of the leaders, writers, thinkers, philosophers, physicians were Jewish. So it was a city full of music, and we still think of Vienna as the home of Johann Strauss, the waltz, and music. In this milieu, Lisa Meitner enrolled at the University of Vienna and was the first woman in the history of the university to earn a PhD in one of the sciences. Her favorite professor who would influence her for the rest of her life, Professor Ludwig Boltzmann. And so here was not only the first woman to graduate from the University of Vienna in the sciences, but she was Jewish. During this period, 1901 to 1906, it wasn't just Boltzmann and the faculty at the University of Vienna of whom she was proud. She understood that 500 miles to the west, in Bern, Switzerland, there was a young man working in a patent office who came up with the equation, the most famous equation known in the Western world and the Eastern world too, very simple equation, E equals MC squared. M standing for the mass of an object, how much it weighs essentially, and C is the speed of light. Not many people paid attention to his finding in 1905. But Lisa, majoring in physics as a 22-year-old, understood what Albert Einstein had come up with in 1905. That equation would play a critical part in the story you're going to learn about and behind every newspaper article that discusses today what the greatest fear is. In Vienna, when she finished her studies, the study of radioactivity was the hottest thing going. And the woman who was behind all of this was a Polish girl, Maria Spodowska, later to be known as Marie Curie. Interesting, she was born on the same day as Lisa Meitner, 11 years prior, in 1867. Marie Curie was one of six children born in a liberal family, just had Lisa. But in Poland, the universities were closed to women. Marie moved from Poland to Paris, where she earned her degrees in science and mathematics. In 1895, she married another scientist, physicist by the name of Pierre. In 1896, they were aware that a fellow by the name of Becquerel discovered 
radioactivity. Marie Curie would go on to discover three elements, including radium. It's important for me to step aside for just a minute from our story, because only in having some understanding of this will the story become meaningful. So, what is an element? I'll give you some examples. Iron, copper, tin, gold, silver, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, helium. These are all what we call elements. Okay? So you have a feeling for what an element is. They're elemental. It is what it is. We find it on the earth, essentially, in one place or another. And these are what we call elements. Copper, gold, silver, oxygen, nitrogen, they are what they are. And each of them has different properties. So what is an atom? An atom is the smallest particle of an element. So you pick up a piece of copper, or you pick up your iron frying pan. Every little particle that makes up that iron frying pan is made up of atoms. And what is a molecule, just so we understand? A molecule is the joining together with chemical bonds, chemical bonds of various atoms. That makes a molecule. So what would be the simplest example of a molecule? Well, I would suggest that it might be water. Water it's very simple. We all know the term H2O. That means that there's one atom of oxygen and two atoms of hydrogen. And they are joined together with what we call a chemical bond. And that's the molecule of water made up of two different kinds of atoms. Two hydrogen, one oxygen, and we have water. Now, what defines an element? What is an element, basically? And what makes gold different from tin versus different from iron? Why are they different? So let's do that. The atom, each atom, has three essential particles. It has a proton, what we call a proton, in its nucleus, the center. It has a neutron in the center, in the nucleus. And swirling outside are one or more electrons. So every atom has protons, neutrons, and electrons. What important for us are the protons and neutrons in the center of the nucleus. So, how do we designate it? We designate it, protons is called the, the atomic number. Very simple. The number of protons is called the atomic number. If you add the neutrons and protons, you get what they call the atomic weight. So the atomic weight is simply the sum of protons and neutrons the atomic number is the number of protons. And this is key. The number of protons in an atom determines what element it is. So if it has one proton, it's hydrogen. If it has two, two protons, or 20 protons, or 75 protons, it's a different element. And so let's take an example, hydrogen. hydrogen has one proton and no neutrons. And because it has one proton, we call it hydrogen. That's what it is. In itself, it is one atom of hydrogen because it has one proton. Okay. And where does it sit in this table? Don't panic when you see this table. It's simply a list of the elements for various reasons in an order. But essentially, you reads from left to right and here you see hydrogen, and it's up to the left because it's one. Let's take another example. Let's take helium. The next heavier element, helium, has two protons. So it's different than hydrogen because it has two protons rather than one. It also happens to have two neutrons in it, and so it's designated this way, two protons, Add up the two and two, and you get four, the atomic weight. And where does it sit in the chart? Well, it sits one over from hydrogen. It's number two. And then we go back three, four, and across like this, as each element in the table has one more proton than the one before it. Are we okay on this? 
if there are any questions, please stop me, because it's critical if we do every step, and then you'll get the whole story. Okay. So, for instance, that which we need to be alive and breathe and supply the fuel for us to live is oxygen. Oxygen is no different than hydrogen or helium, but it's very different. But the only difference is the number of protons in the nucleus. And so it turns out that oxygen has eight protons. We call that oxygen. It happens to have eight neutrons, and we designate it this way, as oxygen is eight and 16. Remember the sum of the neutrons and protons. But what's important are the number of protons. That makes it oxygen. Go in the chart, you go across hydrogen helium, and go across number eight, and you see there is oxygen. The difference between each of these elements is the number of protons. If the number of protons determines which element, what do neutrons determine? Okay. Neutrons determine what we call the isotope of that element, which is simply like a cousin. It's still copper, it's still iron, it's still carbon, but it's a cousin. It still has the same number of protons, but because the neutrons may be different, then we call it an isotope of that element, and some elements have a number of different isotopes, meaning a number of them have different neutrons in their nucleus. Subtracting neutrons determines the isotope. The atomic weight is the sum of the protons and neutron, neutrons reflecting the element and the isotope. Are we okay still? Yes? Talk to me about isotope again. <laughs> okay. So you have an element, right. let's say it's carbon, okay? It has a given number of protons and it has some number of neutrons. There are other atoms that also have the same number. So let's go on to carbon and look at this, and this I think this will answer your question. Carbon has six protons. That makes it carbon. Take a piece of coal. That's carbon. Or charcoal, that's carbon. You know, we talk about carbon footprint. What are we talking about? We're talking about atoms, six proton for carbon. And it made normal carbon majority of carbon that's found when you dig it up in coal has six neutrons in each atom. But there could be more neutrons in some carbon. Could be. In fact, there are. So let's look at this and play with that a little bit. Let's take carbon and it has six neutrons. Now what happens if we do this? Let's add two neutrons. And this can be done in a laboratory. With atomic apparatus, you can send neutrons into a substance. And so let's do this diagrammatically and send one neutron in, and let's send another neutron in. Now, this is not C612, is it? It's now still carbon, but we've added two neutrons. So watch what happens. The 12 turns to 14. 14 here. And because we have filled the nucleus with more neutrons than possible, the, the atom becomes unstable. It's not willing to just sit there. It becomes unstable because it doesn't have a comfortable number of neutrons and protons in the nucleus. And so what happens with a, an atom that is unstable because of the instability caused by too many particles in it. It emits particles, and with each emission of a neutron, trying to get rid of it because it's unstable, it releases energy. Either an X-ray, a beta ray, a gamma ray, an alpha ray. And that is what happens when we used to put our feet in a, in a fluoroscope and look at our toes, or when you go in and have a chest film. You are being radiated with neutrons from an unstable nucleus sending out these what we call rays. What they are are neutrons a radioactive material. We call it radioactive because it's sending out energy in the form of these what we call rays, but they're really particles. So let's take the next step. Marie Curie 
she discovered in the earth three, not one, but three naturally occurring substances, elements that were, quote, radioactive. She discovered stuff which turned out to be three totally undiscovered elements before her. And each of these elements that she discovered were radioactive, meaning that they were each sending out neutrons because of their instability. And the three which she discovered were polonium, named for Poland, her home country, radium, which used to be on your dial of your wristwatches to glow in the dark. When you saw a wristwatch glowing in the dark, it was sending out rays, radioactive rays that we wore on our wrists. And she discovered thorium. Here she is for that work, two Nobel Prizes, 1903 in physics, 1911 in chemistry. And that feat has never been duplicated since. Two Nobel Prizes by a woman. She stands alone in that accomplishment. And what three, where did they stand in the chart that she discovered? Here they are. Polonium, radium, and thorium. How do they differ from each other? They contain different number of protons in the nucleus. Lisa Meitner in Vienna was fully aware of what was going on in Paris, and she wanted to work with Marie Curie. She applied, and she was not accepted. So her father, who had a good deal of money, told her that if she could get some sort of assistant appointment in Berlin, he would pay for her to go to Berlin. And essentially, she went to Berlin to be with Max Planck, who was essentially the grandfather of this kind of atomic physics, at what became the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute. Later, she would be paid a modicum, modicum but never very much. She was never designated as a professor or any official title, but she was happy to be working. And her partner was a chemist, a German chemist by the name of Otto Hahn. He was a nice guy. He worked for 31 years along with Lisa Meyer. They became close friends. He never joined the Nazi party, but he was German. Lisa was Austrian. She had come from Vienna to Berlin. And they worked together on radioactive isotopes, on radioactive materials, studying the elements, the protons, the neutrons. There was a break during her time, during World War I, when she volunteered to be a nurse for the German army, somehow got a position doing as an x-ray technician, because this is what she understood using of x-rays, which is radioactive materials, in order to help with the diagnosis of those soldiers who were injured. Now, it's really important to understand that Lisa was a physicist. Otto Hahn was a chemist. What they do is different. What they understand is different. Their whole outlook is totally different. During this time, there was a vacancy, an opening in the chart there was no one knew what the element 91 was. No one had ever found it. But Lisa and Otto together discovered what became known as actinium. So she accomplished one third of what Marie Curie had done, discovering three elements. She, together with Otto Hahn, discovered element number 91, proactinium. David? Yes. How did they know how many elements to look for? They didn't. They didn't. So, so how did she know there was one missing? Well, because they knew that uranium had 92 <coughs> protons, and they knew some of the other elements had 88, 89, and they knew which are missing. They didn't have an element with that number of protons. Thank you. Yes. Um, Good question. First of all, I'm curious um, what the number underneath means, if, if it's yet all relevant to this. It's not that everything is radioactive if there's if there's not an equal number of protons and neutrons, no. is it? It's not every time there's more that they're kind of. No, they, they become very, what we call radioactive if they're an unstable number. Right, but, but unstable number is not whenever they're not equal. No, it's no, just no, no, some no. other reason. Absolutely. Makes them Going back and summarizing for you, a radioactive element 
is where the atom has too many neutrons and protons for stability. And therefore, there's going to be an emanation of neutrons or electrons is not stable. And that particular point, did they know that something that's radioactive? No, to you. they didn't. Is Marie Curie died <laughs> of her exposure to these radioactive elements. They did not understand the biologic implication of the radioactivity. And she absolutely died from overdoses of radioactivity. We didn't know when we were children. Right, but At least my, when I was well, a kid, you got you dental x-rays, they didn't cover you or do anything. They, mean, you can cover you with a lead sheet, right? Right. Yeah. Not, now but they you did, are getting not radiation through young. your gums yeah. when that happened, until we learned. That's verboten from that. Right. Right. Okay. So this is a little bit of that story. Okay. An interesting element about which we hear all the time. Yes, in the back. When they chose to honor her with that name, um, did they consider her partner? Um, no. They named, she, they, they named it for Lisa. No, what was the reason for that? What was I'd that? have to go back. You need to look up Mindarian, the element Mindarian, and see the, the history. Is that Lisa was a physicist. Right? Otto was a chemist. So now look, look at this element called uranium which is always in the news. What does uranium look like? Well, here's a hunk of it. Uranium is real stuff. It's like holding a piece of copper. Uranium is real stuff. And it has how many protons that make it uranium? There are 92. That's a lot. It's shocker block full of protons. Let's look at uranium. On the left, you see a cousin of uranium, i.e. an isotope, with 92 protons. That's what makes it uranium. And what we call U-235 has 143. That's a lot. 143 neutrons. But most uranium, which is dug up out of the ground, in fact, 99.3% of what's dug up out of the ground, and you look at it carefully, most of it is the cousin U-238, which again has 92 protons, but it has 146 neutrons instead of 143. Why does that become important? I'll show you. But remember that U-235 is just a tiny, tiny little percentage you want 235, you've got to dig up a hell of a lot of uranium and then do something with it, i.e. put it in centrifuges. And you remember reading about the tubes of centrifuges and the big scandals that go on in order for Iran or Russia or any other country to obtain U-235, they've got to spin it down and look for that tiny little amount. Any questions so far on this? Okay. When you have uh, all those neutrons and protons in there, does that actually, is that something that actually weighs more? It weighs more. So everything that's, everything on that chart weighs a little more than Yes. It's a heavy atom. And as a matter of fact, the number at the top is called the atomic weight. Yeah. It's called the atomic weight. Now, is it exactly 238? Maybe 238.532. It's very exact word. Yes, but it weighs more. It's a heavier atom. Let's look at uranium. The unstable nucleus of U-235. It has 143 neutrons. It has 92 protons, which makes it uranium. And there are too many for stability. It's not stable. And so U-235 sends out what it emanates out. They just come out naturally because it won't sit there. It gets rid of neutrons and it gets rid of protons because it's unstable. And this is energy that comes out. And because there two protons are sent out, what is the obvious happening if protons are sent out? It's no longer uranium. Right? The uranium is defined, all the elements are defined by how many protons. 
And so as the alpha rays are sent, emanate out, in this case, two protons and two neutrons, which is essentially a helium ion. Now watch it change. Now there are 90 protons. When this happens, when two protons and two neutrons are sent out, what is left? Now 90 protons are left in the nucleus, 141 neutrons. The number has decreased. And because the number of protons has decreased, it's no longer uranium. It's something else. It is now thorium. The element sitting there on a desk, left alone, will change in front of your eyes from one element to another. And here is what happens. It goes down to, from uranium sitting there, becomes thorium. Now, how fast does that happen? Well, all of the radioactive elements are different in terms of how fast they send out radiation or protons and neutrons. And so as they come out, the scientists, the physicists, will determine how long is it until half the uranium is gone and becomes stored. It may be three minutes, or it may be 50,000 years, or anything in between. It may be, in some cases, millions of years. That's the half-life. And that half-life, in other words, the speed with which these rays come out, vary with each unstable element. Yes? Does it vary with the environment? No. It just does it by itself. It does it by it. You put it in a dark closet, you can put it in front of the classroom, and you probably heard the term Geiger counter. OK? If <laughs> you have some mass of something that's radioactive, by U-235 sitting on the desk for students to look at it, and I showed you what a hunk of it looks like, you can take what we call a Geiger counter, which is an instrument designed to make a noise when these rays are coming out, and the thing will click, 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 like that, and you move it closer, it's going to get more rays. And so this is what happens in Chernobyl, in Ukraine right now, when the people who were watching to see how radioactive any destruction of Chernobyl might be in the Ukraine, they're walking around with Geiger counters and finding out how much radiation is coming out. There should be none because of the lead walls and security. But what they're afraid of is there's going to be a breach of a destruction. And all of Ukraine and Western Europe will be flipped all over and people will die. That's what today's world is, and that is what's happened. OK? All right. So let's take the next step. Yes. Go ahead. Are all radioactive um, elements explosive? They're, it's not that they're explosive. They just emit rays that are dangerous. Yes, but we're going to come to the explosion part of it. Okay. We're going to come to that. In this kind of a reaction, leaving them alone, they're not going to explode. They simply send out radiation. Okay? In my previous example, what happened to the element? Left alone. It goes down two. Right? Yeah. The other possibility, just as likely, is that a different particles leave because of the instability. And it could be that there is a loss of a neutron and an electron and the gain of a proton. Just accept that that can happen. And that was very, very well known by Lisa Meitner, Marie Curie, Otto Hunt. They all knew this, that an element left alone can either disintegrate, decay, by going down two or up one. Yes? Where does it get the extra proton from? I'm not a nuclear physicist, but I'm able to tell you this story. So I apologize for that. But it gains, it gains a proton. And so if you look at what can happen naturally on a chart, can go up one, or as I showed you previously, down two. So when I did this some years ago with a whole group of students, I had everybody go down two or up one. And that was the Bible. Everybody understood that all over the world. 
Yes. And that happens naturally without any intervention yes. or anything. Yes. That's just nature. Yes. Do we understand what causes the instability? I would imagine that physics do a better job than I can. <laughs> but for our purposes, it, it's unstable. Specifically, um, it's yeah. Nice. Now, when you say, yes, it can happen by itself, but you can also cause it to speed up by shooting a neutron into that material. And that will cause it to decay right in front of you. So actually, I had a physicist a professor at Dartmouth when I was doing this for a class. He brought in some material, and he brought in a neutron emitter. And he said, OK, let's go. He had a Geiger counter over here, had the material here, and he had a neutron emitter here. And he said, OK, I'm going to turn on the neutrons. The neutrons go in. And the Geiger counter over here goes click, 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 click. So that if you send the neutron in, it will cause a more rapid decay. That's important. So with this understanding, remember, down to, and the element is changing to some other element. Copper doesn't. Uranium-235 does. U-235 can also go up. So it's either down two or up one. Now I'm telling you what was understood throughout the scientific world through the 1930s as gospel. This is it. This is how our world's materials react. A radioactive element can be made to change to another element down to it was uranium and now it simply has two less protons. Or it's gained one proton and moves up. That is what was understood by the world. And so once more, down to or up one is what occurs naturally and can be forced to happen. Well, this desire by many across the world to turn essentially lead into gold. Wow, why would you want to do that? That's called alchemy. It's sort of like astrology. It's pseudoscience. It's nonsense. You can't take lead and make it gold. That's alchemy. People who did this were portrayed as sort of like making a witch's brew. You can stir it, you can heat it, bake it, you can throw it, you can do whatever you want to, but it remains the same. And there's all sorts of literary folklore written about this attempts by people to cook up a witch's brew and turn one thing into another. You make a soupy, mix it around, heat it up, do something, and end up with gold. That would be pretty cool. You've got to be crazy to think you can do that. Well, none other than perhaps the most brilliant scientist ever was Sir Isaac Newton. And after he finished writing and publishing his Principia of 1687, after he explained gravity, the moon, inertia, he explained all the rules in our universe, he then turned to alchemy. And Sir Isaac Newton ended his career as an alchemist, trying in vain, the smartest guy we've had, to create one element turning into another. And of course, he failed too. But here we are on the cusp of this little, mild-mannered Jewish girl from Vienna who never had a date, was not interested in dating, had no relationships with men, but spent her whole life aside Otto Hahn at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute with no official title and being paid a minimum salary, not calling it alchemy, but trying to find out how our universe is constituted. And so while this was going on, and this was understood up one or down two, there was a scientist, a physicist in Rome by the name of Enrico Fermi. But at the same time in Rome, that he was doing these experiments, 1933, Lisa's at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute, and Adolf Hitler becomes Chancellor of Germany. Now things are going to speed up, not only scientifically, but politically. 
And so Enrico Fermi, down in Italy, in Rome, was sending neutrons into an atom of uranium. You see what happens? He sent one neutron in, and then the isotope comes out U-239, and then something happened. And he got some new products. And he announced to the world, very excited, that he had created two new elements. And since he was adding a neutron and sending out beta rays, then he assumed that it moved up one, and then that moved up one, and he had two new elements, then up one, and then up another one. And voila, he claimed credit for discovering two new elements, although he was hesitant about what they should be named. And so here's Enrico Fermi's claim to the world that he had discovered, created, he didn't discover them, he created, man-made, two new elements, up one and up two. That's going on in Rome while Lisa is watching the Nazis come to power in Berlin. Okay? She's working with Otto Hahn, aware of these claims by her co-physicist down in Italy, Enrico Fermi. And then, 1938, the Germans invade Austria. Without a shot being fired, and to great applause, the Viennese all stood out in the streets, clapping and welcoming Adolf Hitler and the Nazi troops into Vienna. Austria becomes part of Germany. The Nuremberg laws had been written. And Adolf Hitler, with the Wannsee Conference, was out to rid Europe of all Jews. Lisa could not go back to Austria from Germany because Austria was as good as Germany. She was no more safe in Austria than she was staying in Berlin. She was a woman with no country. And so here she is again on June 14, 1938, in Berlin with Otto Hahn wondering how to save her life because her conversion to some other Christianity, Catholicism, or whatever, ain't going to hold with regard to Hitler's laws. She is Jewish. And everybody at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute knew she was Jewish. And Otto Hahn knew she was Jewish. And she knew she was Jewish. So she was anything but safe. Now, the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute was invaded by Nazi troops looking for anybody who might not be. They might not be a Nazi. As Otto Hahn was not, he had never joined the Nazi party. But Lisa was Jewish. And so there was great fear for Lisa. And in preparation for trying to figure out what she should do, she was friends with a Dutch physicist by the name of Dirk Koster. And plans had been made for Dirk, who was not Jewish, to travel from the Netherlands to Berlin meet Lisa, and say goodbye. And as she was leaving in the middle of the night, so the Nazis would not see her, Otto Hahn gives Lisa the diamond wedding ring that his father had given his mother. Lisa had 10 marks in her pocket. That's all. Dirk took the wedding ring and put it in his pocket to protect it in case she researched the border. They left in the middle of the night in Berlin, from Berlin, and traveled on a train to the most dangerous point, which is the border between Germany and the Netherlands. And I suppose with some fast talking or subtlety or maybe just keeping their mouths shut, but whatever they did, they successfully got across into the Netherlands. And of course now we said the ring and 10 marks. All of her work, all of her experiments, all of her recognition was left with her partner back in Berlin. Once in the Netherlands, 
On July 28th, she flew to Copenhagen, where her colleague in physics, Niels Bohr, had his institute and his physics laboratories. And she had a nephew by the name of Otto Robert Fritsch, who was also a physicist, working with Niels Bohr. So the three of them were together, but Niels Bohr did not have a position open in Copenhagen and a position to give to Lisa. But they all knew just across from Copenhagen in Stockholm, there was another physicist by the name of Mon Ziegbach, and he invited Lisa to come to Stockholm and work in his physics laboratory, which she was all too happy to do. Things are happening very quickly. Just a few weeks ago, she left Berlin in the middle of the night to the Netherlands, to Copenhagen, to Stockholm. Meanwhile, she had left instructions for Otto Hahn and their assistant Fred Strassman on what experiments to do to continue her work. She essentially told them in so many words, I want you to do exactly what Enrico Fermi had done in Rome. I want you to bombard U-235 with neutrons. And let's see what happens. And so she left all the details of how to do this with Otto Hahn, who is not a physicist, Fritz Strassmann was not a physicist, and she's up in Stockholm. So the experiment was carried out by Hahn and Strassmann in Berlin on this date, and voila, they claimed that the new products they got was uranium moving down to, as everybody expected, that was the gospel, and then for some reason, thorium decayed to radium, which Marie Curie had discovered as a radioactive element. And so they claimed that this is what they had accomplished. They then, this is the equation that they claimed to have accomplished. Essentially, Enrico Fermi had done the same thing, but he didn't know what to claim. And so excited were they that they rushed to publish to be the first to have done this, and they published these findings in the physics journal Nature Vision Shelter, which went out to the world as their findings, excluding Lisa Meitner. Well, the news of this, of course, traveled, although travel was barred between a non-Nazi country and Germany. Then Kristallnacht occurred in Germany. Stores, companies, any Jewish affiliation, all the windows were knocked down, and 30,000 Jewish men were sent to concentration camps. So this is going on at the same time, leaving Lisa stranded up in Stockholm, knowing that in Berlin, her partner for 31 years is claiming the results of the experiment she had designed at the uh, Kaiser Wilhelm Institute, that he was going to visit Lisa, because he had some doubts also about the veracity of that which he claimed he had done. So a secret meeting was set up with Lisa in Copenhagen and Niels Bohr's Institute, to which Otto Hahn had taken the train, arriving in the middle of the night, and sitting with them was her, her nephew, Otto Robert Fisch, also a physicist. There was great doubt in the mind of Bohr, Meidner, and Frisch that what Otto Hahn was claiming was really what had happened. And Otto Hahn was not a physicist. He was a chemist. He returns the next day, having told no one that he had gone to see Lisa, because that he would be suspect by the Nazis. He came back telling no one where he had gone and what he had learned. But he came back totally perplexed. After the clandestine meeting in Copenhagen, she returns to Stockholm. December of 1938. And what is happening in December of 1938? Nobel Prize Committee is ready to issue a Nobel Prize in physics. And she's sitting in some little apartment with no money in Stockholm. Enrico Fermi 
arrives in Stockholm and is awarded the 1938 Nobel Prize for having discovered two elements still unnamed beyond uranium. So you can imagine the, what it must have felt like for Lisa. She could not go to Austria, could not go to Germany, essentially hiding in Stockholm and sitting there watching her fellow physicists being awarded the Nobel Prize for something that he didn't understand. That it was the same Enrico Fermi who would a few years later be in Chicago working on the Manhattan Project to beat the German Werner Heisenberg so that we could develop an atomic bomb before the Germans. He did this work under the football stadium of the football team in the University of Chicago. That's the Enrico Fermi. Okay, but now let's go back to Stockholm. So Lisa is there, and a letter arrives from her 31-year partner, Otto Hahn. He's again telling her of the fine accomplishment that they <laughs> under her direction in Berlin. Otto Hahn, with Fritz Strassmann, in their rush to publish, to be the, 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 the discoverers of this new reaction, publish their presumed findings, just as Enrico Fermi had done four years prior in Rome, in this the physics journal, Nature Wissenschaften, on December 22nd. Back in Copenhagen, Otto Fritsch is scratching his head and talking with Niels Bohr. Again, saying, I don't think so. I don't think so. Otto Frisch travels on December 23rd, two days before Christmas, to see his aunt, Lisa Mike, and they get together in Sweden to look over at what has been published by her 31-year-old partner in Berlin. But Lisa, having been a physicist, remembers back to the years at the University of Vienna, when in 1905, one year before she was given her PhD, she remembered the equation that was announced by Albert Einstein in Bayern in 1905, which essentially concludes and understands. And Einstein had never done an experiment. The protons in the nucleus of the atom are held together with a binding energy. So he understood that the protons and neutrons are held together with some energy. That's what holds them together. And that's what makes it unstable if there are too many, if they're the wrong number. When the nucleus is broken apart, that binding energy will be released according to the equation E equals mc squared. What does that mean? When the atom is split apart, if you add the mass that's missing, that mass multiplied by the square of the speed of light, which is 186,000 miles per second, is an enormous amount of energy if you break apart an atom. Let's go into that a little bit. It's called the mass defect or binding energy. The mass of the components of an atom is less than its total weight. So think about it this way to try to get this understood. If they and I go out and buy two lemons, and we weigh this lemon and we weigh that lemon, and somehow they join together. And then we put that bag with the two lemons on the scale, and each lemon weighed two pounds. It turns out that it's not four pounds. It's 3.8 pounds. What? How can that be? That is essentially what Einstein is saying, is that if you measure, could weigh the number of protons in an atom, and you take them apart, the weight of them together is less than the two of them apart. What's the difference? There's mass missing, and that mass that's missing is the energy that holds them together. 
So playing that scenario backwards, if you separate the two lemons, out comes the energy. That's what E equals mc squared means. Otto Hahn didn't understand that. Fritz Strassmann didn't understand that. But Lisa Meitner did understand that. And Otto Robert Frisch understood that. And Niels Bohr understood that. But those two had not done the experiment of sending neutrons into uranium. So here it is. If the components of an atom are broken apart, their binding energy will be released. It's the binding energy that holds protons together. You don't need to follow this, but essentially I'm showing you in real weights if you take helium and add helium together, the components of helium, and break it apart, there is going to be a difference of mass units. And that number of mass units that's missing is the equivalent by Einstein's equation of energy. If you take some methane, that's CH4, it's a molecule. Just like propane we use in our barbecue, that's propane. This is methane, it's another gas that you can burn. And if you burn methane and light it with a match, you get a little fire, like your barbecue grill. And out of it, what's produced? Like any fire in your fireplace, it produces carbon dioxide and water. That's a chemical reaction. Nothing has been broken apart in terms of the atoms. The atoms are just rearranging themselves, but they're not breaking. It's a chemical reaction. Light a match. Light a fire in the fireplace. That's a chemical reaction. And if you happen to take 16 grams of methane, which isn't very much, and add oxygen to it, you'll get 211 kilocalories. 211 kilocalories. Kilo means 1,000, so you get... 211,000 kilocalories. Let's take seven grams of lithium and not do a chemical reaction, but let's do a nuclear reaction. We're not going to light it. We're simply going to send a neutron into it. And lithium breaks apart. Instead of one hydrogen atom and one lithium atom, it breaks into two helium atoms. The numbers are the same. The protons are the same. No protons are lost. But you've got a different element with the release of 23 million kilocalories. That is the difference between a chemical reaction, which is a fire, and an atomic reaction. And that is a, an example of the enormous difference between a, a, a normal bomb and an atomic bomb. This kind of mega difference. There they are, two days before Christmas, wondering what the hell happened in Berlin under my direction. She is sitting down with her nephew trying to figure this out. What happened with the experiment that Otto Hahn was so bamboozled about? They understood E equals mc squared. They understood binding energy. Binding energy doesn't come up in chemistry. It doesn't play any part in chemistry. Because that's not what happens in chemistry. It's a combination of atoms with each other, not breaking the atom. And they concluded that what did not happen is what Otto Hahn claimed did happen. Uranium didn't just go down two and give off some neutrons or protons, or go up one by gaining a proton. That's what everybody across the world expected. That was normal. That is not what happened. What did happen, what happened, is that the uranium atom didn't move down to, it split into two pieces. Krypton, 36 protons, and barium, 56 protons, which combined would be, have to be 92. There are no protons lost, and nothing moved down. There was no extra given out. It's just that the two pieces broke apart. And because of the binding energy, they understood there's going to be a huge amount of energy released. 
And so in looking at it very carefully, they concluded that what was produced was krypton and barium, but also bromium and latium, other elements. And so combined, when uranium is broken, it splinters, and you get a series of different elements or a series of pairs of elements. Each pair adds up to the same atomic number of 92. This is what had happened and explained, fully explained, for the first time in world history. And they immediately went to publish so the world would know what had really happened. And this was the first announcement in the history of the world that you could actually create alchemy artificially, break an atom, not have it just decay into something else. And if you look with my diagrammatically, you see that the pairs of elements that are created by what Lisa Meitner had designed, and which Otto Hahn did not understand. So there they are. This was all done on paper. But both of these people, including Niels Bohr, understood the implications. Yes? Does that mean that every time it split, it was a different? Uh... Not every time, but the uranium atom when bombarded with neutrons, will split. But I can't tell you, I'm not a physicist, but I can't tell you what percentage with this pair and that pair and that pair. Right. But there's no, there's, there's no middle, right? It just splits. And, and the, these are the products yeah. of, of, of splitting uranium. It's not, yeah, I can't liken it to taking a lemon and cutting it. That's not what this is, this is splitting the atom. Sorry? Yeah, cutting a lemon to get two apples. That, that, that would be cool. They were fully aware that this is going to be the result. And they saw a war coming. She was hiding from the Nazis. But she knew that there was this other guy by the name of Werner Heisenberg who is just as smart, just as bright, just as into this, who is totally German. And he would understand this, and the race was on to use this in the war. They wrote an article, the two of them, and submitted it to this journal, Nature, February 11, 1939, announcing to the world of all the physics, of all the explanation, that there's no question that that is the initiation of the atomic age with that art. But only a small group knew it. Only Lisa Meitner, Robert Otto Frisch, and Niels Bohr. Just at three. Niels Bohr understood this whole thing because he had been sitting in Copenhagen with Lisa Meitner. And he decided it was time to leave Europe and get the hell out of there. And so he got on a boat to the United States with a Belgian physicist by the name of Leon Rosenfeld. Niels Bohr totally understood because Lisa had been conferring with him, and he couldn't keep a secret. They confer and talk. The nature had not been published yet. The journal had not come out, although the manuscript had been submitted. And they get off in New York, and Leon Rosenfeld immediately goes to Princeton. He's in Princeton when the physics department of Princeton and spills the beans. He says, let me tell you what has been accomplished at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute under the direction of Lisa Mike, but misunderstood by everybody in Germany. You can imagine the earth-shaking moment it was. It wasn't very long before that that the physicists in New York realized the potential. Germany had invaded Poland, and there was going to be a major war Austria is already part of Germany. And Rico Fermi, he understood this. And he understood that he had received the Nobel Prize erroneously. He was given the Nobel Prize for doing this same experiment, but he didn't understand his results. But he understood the implications. And so he confers with Leo Szilard from Hungary on the left. And they decide they need to go see Franco Rosso and let him know that there is this potential. And so who do they need really to convince Roosevelt but Albert Einstein? 
Nobody has the gravitas but Einstein to approach Roosevelt. Einstein was living out in Long Island. And they had to get him down there. So they called this little whippersnapper, young physicist student, by the name of Edward Teller. <laughs> and they asked him to be the chauffeur. Edward Teller agrees to do that at the Manhattan Project. Lisa Meitner travels to England. She's invited after the war to come to the United States. She lectures at Bryn Mawr. She uh, is invited to join the faculty at both Berkeley and Caltech. Turns everybody down. Really did not like the United States. Absolutely refused to be a part of the Manhattan Project. And spent the rest of her life essentially in isolation in Cambridge, England. So that's essentially almost the end of the story, but not quite. The real end of the story could be labeled when race and gender were in the script. Because the last chapter is Otto Hahn being honored with the Nobel Prize in 1945 for the discovery of nuclear fission. What he said to the Nobel Committee, the woman Lisa Mike, with whom he worked for 31 years, to whom he gave his mother's diamond ring when she had the flea, he never mentioned to Lisa Mike. It's an enigmatic, poignant story, but with real relevance to what you read in the newspapers today of what could be the sequelae of Lisa's discovery in going through this physics papers, sitting on the shore and stuff. Now, if you want to get the whole story, it ends up as many things do. It's a California story. I was shopping in Vermont. A physics professor who had been provost of Dartmouth comes up to me. There's a new book out, and it's on Lisa Meitner. And there's never been a biography written on Lisa Meitner before you've got to read it. So around Dartmouth, if Leonard Reeser tells you to do something, you do it. So I got the book, and I'm reading through it, and my mouth dropped open reading the story that I've just told you. Who is this from son? So I look her up, and she teaches chemistry at Sacramento State University. So I said, so where'd you go to school? So I, she said, I earned my PhD at Harvard. I said, well, I was in Harvard too as an undergraduate. And she said, well, what years? Well, it turns out when we did this, that she was my, as a graduate student, she was my lab instructor in, <laughs> in Camp 1. Get hold of this book, and this is your. She's lovely, and this book is a winner. You will not be able to put it down. There was no Bible. Lisa Mike. So that's a story. I thank you very much.